ladies and gentlemen. We're going to get going with the I'm going to let the first act of a wonderful afternoon start right this second. Please take your seats. Please lower your voices. You've never seen anything like this unless you were in McNulty last night. Thank you very much for having me. I'm Gil Weinberg from Georgia Tech. Uh, I will quickly introduce my team. I will start with the humans. On guitar and AI, Mason Breton. And yes, in Georgia Tech, we have students majoring in guitar and AI. On drums and robotics, a former student, Deepak Gopinath. We also have a guest a trumpet player, Daniel Gilman. And later on, we will have Jason Barnes, an amputee drummer, joining us. And maybe the main star of the show is Shimon. Uh, it's a robot that was uh, designed and programmed using AI and robotics to listen to humans, to understand what humans are doing in terms of music. They can understand chord progression and uh, similarity or stability, a lot of concepts using a lot of uh, uh, learning, deep learning, other kind of learning, but also rule-based systems. And then using algorithm to improvise back to us, hopefully surprising us, inspiring us, playing different than how humans play, and hopefully push music to new directions. So uh, I don't, we, we don't have much time, so we'll start with a sh short demonstration, and then some other pieces. In this video, I demonstrate how I control the robotic drumming prosthesis using my forearm muscle. The EMG electrodes attached to my arm send very low latency signals to trigger the robotic stick when I contract my muscle. This allows me to operate the arm in different ways. For example, I can trigger a hit with every contraction, or toggle between different automatic drumming states. This allows me to create cool interactions between my biological arm and my robotic one.
So I thank all of my team. I uh, just want to thank again for having us here. It's a great pleasure. Thank you. I should say that this young man behind me, Mason Breton in the guitar, who's just defended his PhD thesis last week on the interaction between intelligence and machines and music. So congratulations. So what we're getting ready for the next uh, part of our conversation today, um, speaking of intelligence, um, I have to thank some people who've made this week possible. And I tend to get a lot of appreciation from all of you, but I have to say it takes a village to put on the Ideas Festival. And if it weren't for the content team of Jamie Miller and Trisha Johnson and Peter Kaplan and Killeen Bretman and Libby Franklin, none of the content would have happened this week. If it weren't for our partners at The Atlantic who helped entertain, if it weren't for the Aspen Meadows that put on all of the logistics, if it weren't for Deborah Murphy who constantly, constantly works hours on hours to get our speakers here and to help you get here. And there's too many, I'm like the Academy Awards, there's too many to name, but um, it wouldn't happen without them and I wish you would give them all a big applause. Okay, I'm gonna bring up our next presenters. Let's see who they are. We don't know who they are. No. Okay, so. Michael, I'm gonna let you introduce. I know what all of you are thinking. Next year, this panel will be robots too, yes. right? Uh, some of you may think that an improvement. Um, my name is Michael Gerson. I'm a columnist for the Washington Post. A few of you may have vaguely recognized me. The most common thing I hear in airports after I've made an appearance on Meet the Press or the PBS NewsHour, oh, you're that guy who's not David Brooks. <laughs> I'm. Joined by two of the most respected voices in American conservatism. Ben Dominich is a publisher of The Federalist, a CBS contributor, and hosts the Federalist Radio Hour podcast. He started out as an intern for us at the George W. Bush White House speechwriting office, by the way. Pete Weiner is a contributing opinion writer at the New York Times. I would get that right. Um, served as a deputy director of White House speech writing in the George W. Bush administration, and he is, happens to be the finest person I know in life. Together, we're uh, putting together, um, along with uh, David Axelrod, an Aspen program on the recovery of democratic virtues, which I hope all of you will take a look at. Um, I would note that Aspen, in its search for diversity, has chosen three guys who all worked in the Bush speech writing department. <laughs> Or as we're known, uh, or as we're known, the axis of dweebs. <laughs> um, it may be, uh, it may say something about the Trump era, that uh, that most Republican audience in most Republican audiences, we Bush people would be the liberal diversity, <laughs> which raises the question: Miss us yet? <laughs> <laughs> Um, we have gone through the ugliest, most content-free, most cruel and personal presidential election anyone can remember. In the last 72 hours, we have been forced to witness the complete collapse of presidential restraint, judgment, and dignity. I think it's fair to say our public discourse has challenges. Ben, I think many people have a feeling of helplessness seeing the vast mountain of dysfunction. How can we even start a recovery of our discourse? Well, I think that's something we can easily solve in 20 minutes. Um, you know, the, the thing that I find beneficial about this moment, uh, even with this sad state of discourse, is that 
I think it's brought, in, it's brought a lot of people to be more honest about the way they felt. I think that <clears throat> has some lessons for us that are unfortunate in a lot of ways. I learned, for instance, in this past two year period that the American right was a lot more secular than I thought it was. Hmm. Was a lot more willing to put up with crassness and with bullying if you thought of that crassness and bullying as being on your side. And that's something that I think is a disappointing lesson. It's not something that we thought of, certainly, in the Bush era. But I do think that it comes from a lot of different animosity that comes, you know, frankly, in the form of <clears throat> knowing more about each other. Uh, the great Mark Zuckerberg thesis was that Facebook and all of these other entities, Twitter, et cetera, would bring us closer together with people who were different than us. <laughs> it would expose us to all these ideas. It turns out that when that happens, a lot of people get angry at each other all the time. Mm. And it never stops. It's this endless parade of attacks and viciousness. But I also think that in a certain sense, it's more honest about where the American temper is right now, which is a sad revelation, but one that I don't think that we should run away from. Mm. Pete, do you think the quality of our discourse might be improved by focusing on the purposes of debate? Yeah, I think it would. Um, and I think it's something we actually spend far too little time um, thinking about. Uh, we were on a panel session earlier where uh, we were talking about, David had mentioned, epistemological modesty, um, which used to be actually a foundation of, uh, of conservatism. Uh, it doesn't um, mean that, that people don't believe that objective uh, truth exists, but what it means is that we all understand that our ability to apprehend the truth is limited. Uh, if you and I had a, had a difference of, of opinion, and I was we right uh, on, on, uh, on a particular issue. Even if I was 100% right, I couldn't possibly know the full scope of truth. That's just not possible, and that's why we need other people in our lives, uh, including people who don't agree with us, to try, try and widen the aperture um, of our understanding. It's, it's really a notion of, of the wisdom of the, co of the collective, that we are better for having people in our lives, including people who don't see things um, as well. And this really plays into um, confirmation bias, which I think is, is endemic to the human condition. But I think at certain periods and moments in the life of, of, of a country can be um, more acute. And I think we're living through that, that period now. Confirmation bias is, of course, that sense of which you go out and, and search out evidence to confirm what you, you already uh, already know. I mean, I'll give you an example if, you know, if, uh, on the gun control debate, if you're in favor um, of gun control and a serious study came out and said um, that uh, guns uh, were used in self-defense and an unusually large number of innocent people were saved because of, of, uh, of that, um, or that mass killers target no gun zones um, to, to, to commit crimes. Just for the sake of the argument, assume that such a study came out. What would the response of somebody who's, who's pro-gun control be? It wouldn't be, how serious is that study? It would be, what's the best response to it that refutes it? Now, the NRA suffers from this as much or more. We all suffer from it. And I think we just have to be able to name that and understand it. And, and part of what is important, I found, and I, and I think this is true in the literature, is you have to have people in your life who have standing in your life who are able to um, point those things out. It's, it's very unlikely that if there's somebody that you don't know or certainly somebody that you're antagonistic with, if you have a debate with them, they won't change your mind. You need to have people in your life and people in your orbit who have standing that can, uh, that can challenge. So I think that's really important. And to one other thing that's important is we just have to uh, begin to depersonalize um, the political debates. Um, that are going on, and I think one way to do that is to begin for people to talk more openly about the fact um, that our differences aren't because um, people are more morally defective uh, than we are, or that they're always acting in bad faith, or even that they are acting in bad faith, but they just have a different value system. Jonathan Hyde at NYU, um, has he wrote a book called The Righteous Mind, which is a terrific book. And one of the things that he talks about is how conservatives and liberals have different value system. And that's why they process public policy issues in different ways and come, come out in different points. But I think what happens, and I certainly find this with myself, is I assume other people have the same value system as I do. And so if you assume that, and they arrive at exactly the opposite position as you do, 
you think there must be some sort of moral or intellectual defect because the premise is that they see things the same way. And in fact, often what happens is liberals and conservatives uh, have, it, have it at a different value system. That doesn't mean that you're gonna convince each other, but I do think it helps us to understand each other and it, it probably would go some distance toward um, well, but, the ad hominem. But if I could just interject in response, we have to keep in mind how fierce this really has become. Right now, we have seen in the last week in Washington, uh, Republicans accused over and over of wanting people to die because they want to reduce healthcare spending by about six tenths of a percent over the next 10 years. Okay, the, you want people to die. And on the right, you know, you, you had Cecile Richards from Planned Parenthood here earlier. I have on my staff a collection of, our staff is majority female, they're college educated women. They voted for Donald Trump in part because they believe that Planned Parenthood is an organization that does murder for hire as a business. They believe this, okay? And these are deeply moral people who have different value systems and I don't think we should paper over those differences. We have to come at them and say, look, maybe this is a situation where we want more people to live generally. We want more children to be born and grow up healthy generally. We have those aims in mind. How can we come together and be honest about our disagreements without shouting people down, without telling them to shut up, and without accusing them of wanting people to die? Right, I was to say, nobody's talking about papering over differences. I'm perfectly fine. In fact, I'd encourage people to have vigorous debates. I just wish that the debates were more passionate on the intellectual side and less on the dehumanization side. Um, and uh, the difference, the reason we have differences is because people view things in a different way and you're not going to solve that problem by telling people not to have those arguments. But the question is, are there democratic norms and parameters in which that those arguments take place? And you actually need people publicly uh, in, in positions of authority to, to say that mm -hmm. and to be able to call out people when they cross those lines. Just to add another non-controversial element, Ben, do you think it's easier for a liberal or for a conservative to get outside their comfort zone? I think it is very difficult for liberals to get outside of their comfort zones, and I'll explain why. As a conservative, or as a, I'm actually a libertarian, but as someone who holds views that are, let's say, held by a minority, when I turn on any news channel that isn't Fox, I hear views that are different from my own. I read the New York Times, the Washington Post every day, I see views that are different from my own. I read The Atlantic, and I love it, and I see views that are different from my own. I listen to sports radio, and I listen to, I turn on the 6 p.m. ES, ESPN Sports Center, where you have two black liberals going back and forth about issues that aren't just about sports, but are about feminism, about culture, about the way that we value life. It's easy for me to be exposed just in the normal uh, experience of life to, you know, the last three Netflix series that I watched including Glorious Ladies of Wrestling, which you should definitely check out. <laughs> All three of them had abortion subplots where it was viewed as a positive thing in that show. And that gave me perspective on how people you know, think about these issues. I think if you are a liberal, you have to work really hard to find a representation of the kinds of views that led to Donald Trump that it is even, <laughs> you're even capable of reading without being disgusted with it, let's say. And we try at The Federalist to advocate for that. We have liberals come on our radio hour, our podcast, all the time, and we discuss with them. We want it to be a place where respect, which I think is the fundamental thing we're missing in our politics today, is the basis for a discussion where we, we don't paper over things, we don't pretend, but we do say, you know, let's cross the line here. And I would just encourage you all to talk more and listen more when it comes to the people who are on this opposite side of this political aisle, to the extent that you can, I think you have to do something that our politicians and our leaders in media right now can't, and that is bridge the divide one by one, talking to your neighbors who have different views than you. You agree with that? Well, at, the, at the risk of being accused of sucking up to an Aspen Institute crowd, no, I, I don't. Um, <laughs> I've, uh, I've been a lifelong conservative. I actually think that there's been a, a change uh, in conservatism in probably the last decade and which has really been more pronounced in the last um, several years uh, and that conservatives are now living uh, in their own intellectual silos and I can cite you uh, and I know plenty of conservatives who can go through uh, a day and simply get uh, information whether it's from uh, websites uh, or from Fox News or from publications um, that uh, that they just don't want to be bothered uh, by um, 
by competing uh, narratives and competing facts. I mean, we did have a senior counselor to the president go on the air and use the phrase alternative facts. And if you read the full context, that's not taken out of context. This was, an, it, it, this, <laughs> this was about whether uh, uh, President uh, Trump and the number of, of uh, people who had been at his, at his inauguration, and then there was the, the question of three to five million illegal votes. And you've got now, um, I'm sorry to say, but you've got a person as President of the United States that's engaged in a full out, all out assault on truth. And it's, in, and it's empirical truth, and it's demonstrative truth, and it doesn't matter to him. But what is troubling as a conservative is it increasingly doesn't matter to a lot of conservatives and Republicans because they've thrown their hat over that wall and now they're chasing it. And he's going down and he's gonna bring a lot of good people down with him. Um, so this is not a situation anymore in which uh, this is one side or the other or liberalism or conservatism. Part of it I think is a product of, of the information age in which, in, uh, in which we, we live because it's so easy for us. To, uh, to, to live in our own uh, uh, epistemological universes. I, I don't want to end with um, disagreement, so maybe I can ask you, Pete, if you were to change a few things about our public discourse other than the occupant of the Oval Office, what, <laughs> what, what would they be? What would you change? Uh, I guess I'd say a couple of things. Um, I mean, it's no, in no order of priority. Um, one is that I do think, and I've become increasingly convinced, that we need people um, in some authority to challenge uh, one's own side. Um, that is, if, if Barack Obama uh, lectures uh, conservatives or Republicans on a particular issue, or a conservative president lectures uh, Democratic members of Congress, that doesn't work. In fact, it has the opposite effect. It inflames people. They dig in their heels. They get angry. They say, why are you lecturing me? What we need to have is people who are willing to challenge folks um, from one's own political tribe to challenge political tribalism. Now, it's harder than it used to be um, because you know two, three, two generations ago, you had William F. Buckley, and he was able to challenge the John Birch Society with conservatism. And unfortunately, there aren't a lot of authority figures today. But it's so easy to see the mistakes and the confirmation bias and the dehumanization of the other side and so much harder to see it on our own. And even when you see it, it's even harder to be able to challenge your own side. And we know this from, from uh, research of sociology. Uh, David Brooks knows this probably as well as anybody. But what happens is when you have people with the same beliefs, you've created a community. And so to challenge people on beliefs means that you, you have the possibility of being alienated from, from your own community. So I think that's. One thing, the second thing, just apropos of what Ben said, and this goes for, for all sides, we just have to listen better. Um, you know, political discourse is, is probably like any other relationship, marriage relationship or any other. If you, if you have a disagreement, you've just got to feel heard. You've got to, you've got to believe that the other person has heard your point of view and, and even respected it, even if they don't agree with it. Uh, the last thing is I think we have to create institutions um, who are going to be able to articulate the case um, for democratic virtues. This is a project you and I, David and Axelrod, are involved with. In our case, moderation, civility, um, and compromise. Because I, I really do believe those, um, those, and we believe that those virtues are not only important, but they're under assault in a way that, um, that they never happened before. I think for, for a long period of time, I think people were indifferent to it. But now I think they really are under attack. And we have to have people out there who actually believe in those things and are willing to defend them in public. Take the issue of moderation. People have to disentangle what that even means. A lot of people hear the word moderation, they think it's a sign of, of weakness. It's not. Um, it can often be a sign of strength. Ramon Duron, a great French intellectual, was a, was a model of temperamental moderation and a man of great courage because he stood against the French intellectuals of. Uh, of his age, the antithesis of moderation isn't conviction, it's intemperance. And, uh, and we live in an intemperate age. And uh, I do think that we need institutions, the one that we're working on and others, to try and, uh, and push back against it. What would you change? Ben? So uh, there's a great line from C.S. Lewis about uh, the evil of newspapers. 
And he says, the rapid diffusion of news brings all the sorrows of the world to your front porch every morning. And that the danger is that that becomes something that prevents you from focusing on the people whose lives you can affect directly who are around you. I think one of the best things that is happening to the American center left at this moment is a realization that at the end of essentially a century long period of centralization of power in Washington, uh, that maybe that wasn't the best way for us to learn to live together. And that in reality, getting back to localism, getting back to neighborhood, getting back to governing each other at the local level is something that can be very virtuous and allow us to live in ways that are very different and allow the different aspects of American life to become more central for us, to allow places to be in this way. Now, as, as a small government libertarian, I very much to want to live in an America where people are free to worship their God, to raise their kids, to grow their pot, to buy their guns, to sell their raw milk, to hoard their gold, and to basically get together with all the other people they want to freely associate with and decide how much gambling hookers blow in bike lanes you want in your neighborhood. It's making America great again. And then we can decide, <laughs> and that's, exact, that's exactly it. And then we can all decide where to live accordingly, you know? And, uh, and he can go away from the gambling neighborhood and I can go into it. So the, the thing that I find wonderful about this, as, as fractious a time as it is, and as much as, as everybody is at each other's throats all day, is I do think that for my left of center friends, there's this appreciation now that, you know, the imperial presidency is not the way to run things. That the best way is to get back to a point where we trust the people. We trust the people to govern themselves, to govern their neighborhoods, to govern their lives and direct it. And we trust, you know, frankly, the people, you know, the people who I've met here who come from so many different communities, who have so many different priorities uh, for the things that they want to change in their neighborhoods and their towns. Let's get back to that. Hmm. that makes sense. Hmm. Um, Pete, in all of this, uh, Trump is playing an a intensifying role. It's, do you think that he is a cause or a symptom? I think he's probably both. Um, I mean, I, these, these trends that, that uh, uh, helped elect him uh, were in motion long before he, um, he, he took office. But um, I think the concern is that he is accelerating them and he's amplifying uh, them. Uh, and we have, um, as president, uh, the most disruptive and transgressive person in American history. Uh, and that, I think, is a huge, um, huge problem. I should say this, by the way. Uh, I'm a lifelong Republican uh, and conservative, and I've, I've worked in three Republican administrations and, and in the George W. Bush White House for 70 years. And I declared relatively early that I wouldn't um, vote for Donald Trump. And I heard from, of course, as you might imagine, from a lot of friends and, and Republicans and conservatives, why not? And the argument that they made, and it wasn't an unreasonable argument from a conservative perspective, is, well, what about the courts? Certainly, he's going to promote policies that are more conservative than Hillary Clinton. Uh, and I conceded that. I don't think he's, Trump is a conservative by, by any means. Um, but for me, uh, the reason that I couldn't cast a vote for him was because in the end, and I think this is, in, frankly, um, informed by my uh, time in government, and this realization hit me before Trump, but it's more vivid now, which is the most important uh, quality, I think, in a, in a president above all, uh, is judgment, is wisdom and prudence, less where they check the policy boxes. That's not unimportant. I spent most of my life in, in public policy. But there's so much that's contingent in life, so many things you and I, all of us know from, from the Bush years, that we didn't expect 9-11 would happen. We didn't expect that the, that the presidency would be redefined. You can't anticipate what will happen. And in the end, you have to trust the character broadly defined of the person who is president. And in my estimation, Donald Trump was not only uh, worse than Hillary Clinton in that, on that front. He's worse than anybody I've ever seen in public life. Um, I think he has... I, th I think he has uh, a disordered personality. Uh, and I think that um, when that happens and you combine that psychological and emotional profile with the powers of the presidency, not very much good can happen and an awful lot that's bad can happen. And I think that the uh, last 160 days probably is strengthening my argument more than I wish it were. Ben, how do you respond? How do Trump conservatives respond to those well, concerns? 
I, I should say I, I did not vote for Donald Trump. I voted for The Rock, who will eventually be our president. I'm sure. very confident. <laughs> um, so I'm getting on our board early, and I hope that you'll come around. Uh, John Mulaney, the comedian, uh, I still think had the best summation of, of Donald Trump, and he did it before he ever ran for president. He said, Donald Trump wakes up every morning, and he asks himself, what would a cartoon rich person do? <laughs> and so that's, so I have a, a slightly more benign, my actual concern what, as it relates to his character is actually about um, the absence of faith. I think I would have a much different attitude toward this president if I thought that he believed in the Almighty or had a relationship with uh, the author of all things. As a Christian, if he were a believer, that would worry me more, I must <laughs> say. But anyway. As Chester said, the whole, of, the whole world is at war over whether something is a devouring suspicion or a divine hope. And so perhaps I'm being hopeful in that uh, sense. I, I think that as it relates to what Trump is doing to our political discussion is that he's revealing that the argument wasn't the argument that we thought it was within the American right. That there was this strain that was supposed to be the establishment chamber of commerce strain and that it was doing battle with these populist ideologues with their tri-corner hats. And it turns out that there was this huge swath of people in the middle between those two poles that had very different priorities and viewed this essentially as, as who will fight in my interest. That they didn't share Paul Ryan's values or Jack Kemp's values or Ronald Reagan's values when it came to international trade or global order or all of these other things. And that instead, they just wanted someone who would fight for them in a world that they increasingly view as for themselves post-apocalyptic. You know, when you, and from my perspective, the more interesting thing is what happens when, as you know, that project, that promise uh, fails to deliver. You can look back and you can basically say that the American people have been voting for change in the presidential election over and over and over again. They voted for it with Carter, they voted for it with Reagan, they voted for it with Clinton. Bush and Gore, you know, was basically this, this, it was as fractious as it was because it was, uh, you know, what kind of change are we going to have? They obviously voted for it in Barack Obama and then they voted for it with, with Trump. The problem is that the demands that they're making of government, I think, are bigger than what government can deliver. And that they're actually demands that need to be more focused closer to home within their communities, as I've been saying, that, that that's where the real problem lies and has to be solved on that level, not on the national. All right, uh, let me conclude by passing out some antidepressants and, uh, by, <laughs> and by thanking our panel for their personal contribution today to better discourse. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Adam. Go in the back. Yes. Wonderful. Where's the clock? It is right there. Did you see it? Oh, yeah. yeah. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi, everyone. I'm Katie Couric, and I'm uh, happy to represent womankind in this closing <laughs> session of the Aspen Ideas Festival. <laughs> um, first of all, I've been given a lot of tough jobs at this festival, but I think the toughest one so far has been to talk to the two of the brightest minds in Aspen, in the country, hell, in the whole galaxy in 20 minutes. I begged for more time this morning, so I got 25. So everyone knows David Brooks and Tom Friedman, New York Times uh, award-winning columnists, authors, and all around great human beings. Hi, guys. So we're going to kind of go over some of the same territory, but hopefully we'll have some original things to say. Mm -hmm. um, let me first by ask, start by asking you, we're not going to focus obsessively on Donald Trump as much as he'd like us to. But I want to ask you about um, how are you able to keep Donald Trump from taking over your columns and your lives? Tom, I know you've done this very 
very consciously? Uh, well, uh, first of all, Katie, it's great to be here with you and David. Um, uh, the way I do it is um, uh, I go back to what I, where I started. I go back to being a reporter. Um, and to me, I do not want to look back at the four years of Donald Trump and say I spent four years shaking my fist at him and didn't learn anything. So um, I've been writing a book. I've been working on the payback version of it. Uh, you know, that's the, the, the most important thing. Um, you know, uh, there, was, there was no good time, in my view, there's no good time for Donald Trump to be president. Um, this is a uniquely bad time. Uh, because I believe we are in the middle of not one, but three climate changes at once. Uh, and when the world accelerates, small errors in navigation have huge consequences. Okay, it's like a 747 pilot who just transposes two digits. You can get really off track really quickly. So I think we're in the middle of a change of the climate, of the climate and the climate of biodiversity. We're going from what I call later to now, okay? So when we grew up, you could fix your garden, you could repair your forest, you could restore your ecosystem later or, or, or you know, whenever you got around to it. Later is now officially over. Later will be too late, okay? So we're right at that moment when this guy is president. I think we're in a change in the climate of globalization. We're going from a world that was interconnected and then hyperconnected to a world that is interdependent. So when the world gets this interdependent, you get a lot of really weird inversions. Your friends can kill you faster than your enemies. If Greece goes under, everyone in this room will be affected. Greece is a NATO ally, an EU member. And your rivals falling becomes more dangerous than your rivals rising. So if China's economy collapses, it'll be a lot more important to everyone in this country than if China takes over another rock in the South China Sea. Lastly, we're in the middle of a incredible, I think, climate change in technology. We now live in a world where machines are acquiring all five senses. And as a result, you can now analyze, optimize, prophesize, customize, and automize at a speed, scope, and scale we have never seen before. Um, you can analyze, you can find needles in haystacks, you can optimize. Uh, GE can tell you exactly how to fly your plane at each altitude to maximize the energy. You can prophesize, look at the Watson ad, the guy who shows up at the building to repair the elevator, and they tell him the elevator isn't broken. He says, yes, but it will be in a month, okay? Um, we all know how you can customize now, and automize, we just got a, a definition of. That is changing the fundamental nature of work. And when you're in the middle of three climate changes at once, you want someone, A, who reads, who thinks, who has smart advisors, and you want someone who has the temperament that Pete Winter talked about. Well, luckily, it's giving you plenty to write about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and yeah. what about you, David? I mean, are you consciously uh, trying to avoid writing about the Trump administration every time you have to turn in a column? Uh, first, let me thank you. It's a, I just want to say it's a pleasure to be here with America's sweetheart and also with Katie Couric. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that was coming. <laughs> Shecky Brooks. <laughs> Especially since this is the last time we're doing this. We're booked next year to the New Orleans Ideas Festival. Uh, <laughs> and this in Bourbon, a little higher. Uh, no, I wake up uh, every morning thinking, you know, I will not be obsessed with Donald Trump today. I'll be obsessed with Steve Bannon. <laughs> uh, um, well, there, there are a couple things to be said. The first is our readers are obsessed with Donald Trump. If you go to the New York Times most viewed top 10 at any moment, I'm sure at this moment, eight out of those top 10 will be about Donald Trump. And so what's fascinating to me, we've been thinking about this guy, the whole world has been thinking about one human being for two solid years without respite. And so never before in human history have so many people thought about one person. And let's face it, some mornings there's not a lot going on in that one person. I think like the whole world attention, the intelligence of the world on six fireflies in a jar. And so yeah. it's, it's like, what is going on here? And so th the way I try to deal with it, uh, I try to not deal with it on the tweet level, but on the what does he represent level. And my basic response, which we've heard, is that Donald Trump is the wrong answer to the right question. That the people who elected him deserve to be heard, deserve some to be paid attention to. What does it lead to? Is Trump part of a global movement of, of shifting our politics in fundamental ways? And the question to be asked in this audience is, a lot of us are members of the establishment, the elite, in what way have we failed? 
And I think that's a, that's a question to be pursued in some serious way. Well, let's talk about that. I mean, I think the massive polarization is definitely fueling our obsession because everyone feels so passionately one way or the other about Donald Trump. And that's why people are reading and just basically ingesting so much and consuming so much information. Uh, Secretary of Defense Mattis said he wasn't worried about ISIS, he wasn't worried about Russia, as much he was worried about how divided America is. And I know, David, you've written that it's not left versus right, but it's, clo it's open versus closed. So what do you mean exactly by that? Yeah, well, it, you know, I spent a year, more than Tom, writing 16 columns, 20 columns, don't worry, Donald Trump will never get the Republican nomination. <laughs> and so, like Tom, I've tried to figure out what, did, at least what did I get wrong? Uh, and so that, you know, so have gone out in the country. Uh, and I think the basic formulation with I think Trump understood better than a lot of us is that the fundamental debate globally is between those who feel the headwinds of globalization smashing in their faces, uh, who favor open, who favor closed trade, closed borders, closed social mores, and just some protection. And those of us, most of us in this room, who feel the headwinds of the meritocracy at our backs blowing us up to greater opportunity. And we tend to favor open trade, open borders, uh, and open social mores. There's a book just out last week uh, called uh, The People From Somewhere. I may be getting the type, topic slightly wrong. Some of us could be do our jobs from anywhere. We could be in Aspen, we could be in Vail, we could be in Beaver Creek, no, the other place. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so we could do our jobs anywhere. But there are some people who grow up in Steubenville, Ohio. Their grandparents were from Steubenville. They're from Steubenville. Their job's in Steubenville. They're in Steubenville. And so they are the people from somewhere. And they have all sorts of resentments, and they feel incredibly invisible to people like us. And, and Tom, you wrote a column, I think it was on June 21st, and you talked about we've all turned into Sunnis and Shiites. And I think it was called something about uh, where did we the people go? And so, can it be fixed? I mean, I think we all recognize how separate we are and, and the fact that there are two Americas right now. But how, how can we come together, or will it be this way ever thus? Yeah, it's a really important question. Um, it was actually an answer to a question. I was up in Canada, and a Canadian businessman stood up and said, what do you fear most? And I said, I fear two things. That one is the, the, the death of facts and truth, that we can't even agree on the temperature. Uh, when we look at the thermometer. And, um, uh, and the second is that we are turning into Sunnis and Shiites. We call them Democrats and Republicans. Um, but uh, the same kind of tribalization and sectarianism, I watch rip apart the Arab Middle East, uh, uh, is, coming our, is coming our way. So what is, uh, you know, what is behind, I think before you can say how to fix it, what do you think is behind it? And uh, I think uh, a big part of what is going on right now um, uh, is what I call, you know, in, in this age of acceleration, is that more is increasingly on you. That is, the days when um, you could go to college and uh, get a four-year degree and then dine, or two-year degree, or high school, um, and then dine out on that for 30 years uh, in your career is really over. So, um, uh, you know, I, I, in, in my book, I quote this uh, Minnesota congressman who talked about growing up in Minnesota, Minneapolis, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, he said, if you, if you were a white male in Minneapolis in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, you actually needed a plan to fail, okay? You actually had to sit down and draw up a plan to fail, because there was such an updraft of white-collar, blue-collar, high-wage, middle-skilled work. And high-wage, middle-skilled work was the foundation of the American middle class. Now, for a lot of reasons I won't go into, basically, that has been blown asunder. There's now high-wage, high-skilled, and there's low-wage, low-skilled, but there's less in the middle due to a combination uh, of a number of, of, of uh, technological and global factors. And so today, you really need a plan to succeed. Um, and you actually have to update it every six months. And so um, uh, my teacher and friend, Heather McGowan, you know, likes to say, never ask a kid what you want to be when you grow up, because whatever it is, it ain't going to be here unless it's policeman or fireman. Okay, so only ask your kid how you want to be when you grow up. Will you have an agile learning mindset predisposed to lifelong learning? Well, you know, David Brooks is, I am, that's how I'm wired, I love learning, going out. But not everyone is. A lot of people, and they are good people, were, were born and bred to go to work, do what they were told, and do it well, and put in a good day's work and expect to be remunerated for it. That is gone, okay? Um, that the, the need for lifelong learning now 
is, is rising every day against this thing, all right? And so as a result of that, what we're seeing is uh, another friend of mine, Marina Gorbis, who runs the Institute of Future, um, says the biggest divide in the world today is no longer the digital divide. That's it. You know, the days when Denver had internet, Northern Colorado didn't, we had it, Gabon did that's gone, okay, or it's going away. The most important divide in this world is going to be the motivational divide. Who has the self-motivation to do that lifelong learning constantly when mom and dad are not around to ask, Katie, did you do your homework? Well, a lot of people aren't built for that world. And I think what's roiling a lot of people, and you, you can see this in Hillbilly Elegy and other things, is the stress and strain of needing a plan to succeed. My uncle was, the, um, was a loan officer at the Farmers Mechanics Bank in Minneapolis in the, uh, the mid-1960s. He only had a high school degree. Where is there a bank in America today where you can be the loan officer with only a high school degree? So what do we do about this, David? You know, this divide between motivated people and almost really class warfare that we're seeing. You know, as, especially as the earlier panel, as we were talking, I'm thinking of my mentor, the guy who was mentoring me, was a guy named Bill Buckley. And I was a student at the University of Chicago, and I was a humor columnist, and he came to campus, and uh, I wrote a parody on what a name-dropping blowhard the guy was. <laughs> and I said he wrote the first three volumes of his memoirs on the day of his birth, uh, like all of human history after the conception, then the seeds of utopia about his gestation, the glorious dawn. And at Yale, he founded two magazines, one called the National Buckley, one called the Buckley Review. <laughs> he merged to form the Buckley Buckley. Uh, spends his afternoons going to rooms to make everybody else feel inferior. And so it's really mean. And so he gives a talk at the audience, and he says, uh, David Brooks, if you're in the room, I'd like to give you a job. And I wasn't in the room. <laughs> I, <laughs> I was actually cool. out in um, San Francisco doing my, making my national TV debut. Wow. I was debating Milton Friedman on PBS. Wow. And I was a socialist. Wow. And I would use six, I would make a long argument, Friedman would destroy it in nine words. <laughs> <laughs> and then the camera would linger on me for 20 or 30 seconds as I tried to think of what to say. <laughs> and you can go on YouTube and you'll see a guy with big glasses, a lot of hair. Uh, but Fuck. when he gave me that job, he never asked me my ideas or my political ideology. He just wanted to give somebody a chance who he thought had some potential. And the previous people in that job included people like Joan Didion, uh, John Leonard, who was a great theater critic in, in New York. And he was not think Bill was not thinking left or right. He was just thinking about the person beneath the ideology. And it was just, I, thank mm -hmm. God for that. And so I do think we have so, like there, there's a great TED talk, which I highly recommend looking at, called The Dangers of a Single Story. And we have the danger of a single identity. We may be right, we may be left, but we got a million other identities. And so we just need to engage each other on those other identities. Uh, and if that doesn't work, if we got invaded by Canada, we would unite. Yeah. Um, so. <laughs> Let's talk about sort of something, Tom, that you touched on on that same column about sort of the, the need for not only formal authority, but moral authority. And of course, David, you've written extensively about this. I mean, how can our leaders and really all of us get back on this road to character? You know, what can we do and why have we, why have we gone so astray, or some of us anyway? Why don't you go first? <laughs> well, you know, I think we've raised a generation that we haven't given them a moral vocabulary. Uh, you know, and I, I think the, the basic language we haven't given them is a, a deep sense of humility and service. One of my heroes, we all have uh, heroes who are moral heroes. One of my heroes, which I've talked about here in years past, is a woman named Dorothy Day. And the story about Dorothy Day is she was a young woman uh, who was living in Greenwich Village, and she was the sort of person, when she read a novel, she didn't just read it. She became like the characters she was reading about. Uh, and unfortunately, she read a lot of Dostoevsky. Uh, <laughs> and so she was drinking, she was carousing, hanging around with criminals, uh, two suicide attempts, two abortions, and she was really fragmented. And psychologists have this concept, they have two kinds of patients, those who need tightening and those who need loosening. Uh, and she needed tightening. And she, uh, it, her tightening came when she was uh, 28 or 29, and she gave birth. 
And I'm gonna butcher the quote, but she wrote this great piece about what it's like to give birth. And it's mostly the piece about the pain, but it ends with a paragraph where she says, if I had written the greatest symphony, composed the greatest poem, sculpted the greatest sculpture, I could not have felt the more exalted creator than I did when they placed my child in my arms. And with that came a need, a need to worship and to adore. Uh, and uh, just who do I thank for this? We have a friend, Catherine Cox, who's married to Charles Murray. She said, when my daughter was born, I realized I loved her more than evolution required. <laughs> 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 and out of that, and I don't care if you believe, a believer, non-believer, whatever, some sense of gratitude and blessedness does lead to a sense of, okay, what am I gonna be worth, how am I gonna be worthy of this moment? And Dorothy Day spent the next 60 years of her life really being tough on herself, but also not only serving the poor, but living with the poor and trying to say, I'm not a saint, don't thank me. I'm failing every day. And that sense of deep humility, of knowing when, where you're failing every day, to me the definition of humility is radical self-awareness from a position of other-centeredness. The ability to get outside yourself and to see yourself with exact honesty. Where you're strong, Lincoln was very humble, but knew where he was strong, and where you're weak. And so I wrote this, we wrote this book called uh, The Road to Character on Humility in 2015, and the events of 2016 show what a great success that book had. <laughs> <laughs> but Tom, you, you know, you talked about in that column why it's so important to have moral authority in a leader, can you, can you? Well, I, I was uh, really quoting my, my friend Dove Seidman who made the point that there's two kinds of authority. There's, there's formal authority uh, and there's moral authority and moral authority can only be earned and inspired. Um, it can't be commanded. Uh, Trump tried to command moral authority from Comey um, and uh, uh, tried to use his, more, his formal authority to command loyalty from Comey but um, uh, m that kind of loyalty can only be inspired. And right now we have a president, who we pointed out in that column, who has formal authority and zero moral authority. And that is really going to matter when we get into a crisis. Because there is going to be a crisis. We have to remember, all the crises we've had in the last five months have all been created by Donald Trump. Oh, really? I mean, uh, the, the crises we have coming, uh, whether it's Korea or, or Iran or Russia or China, there's going to be a point where Trump is going to have to look into the camera and say, trust me. Um, and that's when you're going to see what happens when you have a president who has formal authority and no moral authority. Now, you know, I love listening to David because he really, we come, at, we often say we end up in the same place, but we come at it from really different perspectives. He's really a uh, deep uh, thinker on philosophy and sociology, and everything I know, I know as a reporter. Um, that's really I, how I learn. And um, uh, so to the, I would answer the same question that you asked David by uh, giving the answer I give when young people come to me and say, I'd like to be a reporter uh, and a columnist. What do I need to know? And I uh, always tell them, well, it's really good to be able to type fast. I can type really fast. Um, I actually went to secretarial school in London uh, to learn how to type fast. And it's good to know some philosophy and economics and literature and history and politics. But I think there's two things you need, I think, to be a, a good reporter and columnist. Uh, the first is you have to like people. Uh, you have to really enjoy hearing the music of their lives, the crazy things they hope, desire, fear, um, say, think. And, um, and I really do like people. And because when you like people, they tend to like you back, and then they open up. And the heart loosens, and really amazing stuff comes out. As an aside, I will tell you, I'm always shocked by the number of reporters who hate people. Um, <laughs> and, um, really? Uh, uh, but the other thing you need, and um, uh, David touched on it, is... Um, uh, I think you need to be a really good listener. And I learned this as a reporter, being the first New York Times Jewish correspondent in the Arab world. And having covered the Arab world for now almost you know, 40 years um, as a Jewish kid from Minnesota. And if you watch my reporting, you know I'm not out there saying, you're all wonderful, you're all great, it's all the Israelis' fault. I'm often very much in their face. But there's one thing I learned, and I learned it from having to sit in a room with young Arabs who have printed out all your columns and are sitting there waiting to carve you up. And that is the single most important, uh, I think, tool of journalism and survival mechanism is to be a good listener. And for two reasons. And the second is more important than the first. First, when you're a good listener, it's amazing what you'll learn. But the much more important reason is because listening is a sign of respect. 
And when people think you respect them, it is amazing what you can tell them. And when people think you don't respect them, you cannot tell them the sky is blue. And um, to me, the challenge is if I'm going to go into a room with young Arabs and I'm going to say my piece and they're going to say theirs, when I'm done, do they come up and all want to get a selfie with you? You know, that's, that means you, 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 got, you, you got somewhere. You know, there's a Talmudic phrase, what Dove taught me this, you know, what comes from the heart enters the heart. What doesn't come from the heart doesn't enter the heart. And if people think you respect them, it's amazing how much your advice they will listen to. I've been listening so intently, I can't remember my next question. <laughs> <laughs> um, Bless you. A first uh, in 30 years. <laughs> okay, we only have a few minutes left. I, know, I wanted to talk about sort of the return of, of uh, community and, and local involvement that Ben mentioned, which I think is obviously something that you both uh, think is a really welcome development at the grassroots, individual, family level, local level. But I don't have time because my husband, John, thought it'd be really fun to do a lightning round. Oh, so we're going to do a quick lightning <laughs> round to kind of bring up the mood of the room so we don't have to all be on, what do they call Trumpamine? <laughs> anyway, all right, so here, here are quick questions. What, books, what book are you currently reading? Uh, the World is Flat. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, wrong answer. No, 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 wrong answer. It's thank you for, no, it's thank you for being late. That's thank what you for being late. Thank yeah. you for being late. But, okay. I've just read, the world is flat. Tom came into my office like 12 years ago yeah. and yeah. said, I got this new title, the world is flat. And I thought, uh, that'll never work. <laughs> what book are you really reading? I'm, I'm about to do an event with this woman, Arlie Hochschild. She's written a book. Somebody can help me with the name of it. Stri Oh, so I'm reading that one. Okay. What about you, Tom? <laughs> I'm actually reading The Road to Character. Um, no, no, uh, no. Okay. All right. What book? What book are you anxious to reread? Any? Mm. Don't say the world is flat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my friends uh, Eric Ben Jolson and Andy McAfee, who are here this morning, I don't know if they're or they're in the room, but they they've got a new book out, um, which um, uh, I'll mangle the title, so I I, I won't. Um, uh, but I'm dying to read it. Um, okay. As they wrote a book that really inspired me to, to write, Thank You for Being Late. Anything that you want to go I back to? I just reread um, uh, Anna Karenina, uh, and it, there's, there's about 70 pages in the middle there that just bowl you over with one emotional surprise after another. And it's so easy to get away from novels in our business. Yeah. And we have a friend, when, when he's not writing his novels, uh, his wife says to him, you're kind of cranky, you read a novel. <laughs> uh, and so I, I might try Brothers Karamazov. Mm -hmm. Okay. David, you just celebrated your two-month anniversary to your lovely wife, Anne, and they said it wouldn't last, so mazel on that. Um, what do you think is the key to a successful marriage? Tom, I'm going to start with you, actually. <laughs> uh, well, without being sappy, you know, I'm, I mean, Anne, as everyone knows, is my editor. She's edited every column I've ever written in 21 years, I mean, uh, including from spaces far and wide. And, I think the key is um, to have someone who's not only a loving partner, but who uh, can teach you uh, every day and for whom you have tremendous respect. Aww. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Everyone's like, aww. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good no. luck beating no. that. <laughs> <laughs> No, Tom and I are really close. I want to assure the audience we didn't marry the same Anne. <laughs> <laughs> we married different Anne. That's right, but all Anne's are uh, yeah. the, the best bit of advice I got was when you're in a fight with uh, your wife, your tendency is to think that her selfishness is the problem, when in fact your selfishness is the problem. <laughs> and so you should go into every conversation uh, with the sense that your own selfishness is the problem here in this situation. And then I would say two other things. Uh, when you marry someone you profoundly love, you have fused yourself together in some fundamental way so early on that being apart from that person, no matter how much argument may be going on, becomes impossible to consider. Taking Aspen out of the picture, what's your favorite place to vacation? Um, I. My absolute favorite place to vacation is a place I just was um, uh, two days ago, and that's my hometown, um, uh, St. Louis Park, uh, Minnesota, uh, where, where I 
um, where, I, where I grew up. And if I, I could just elaborate on it, because Ben raised this point, and I, and I think it is important to just interrupt the lightning round for a second. Okay. Um, uh, and that is that, um, you know, there's this image of America today that uh, this is a country divided between two coasts that are pluralizing, diversifying, and modernizing and globalizing. And an inert center where everyone's on opioid, voted for Trump, and waiting for 1950 to come back. And, um, uh, and I think that is, that is such a wrong picture of the country. And, in fact, you profiled and Austin, I, Indiana. Yeah, I, I did a trip through Appalachia, but this really, I got into this because I grew up in the middle in, a, in this small community outside of, of Minneapolis. And that um, I really do believe uh, uh, that um, the, the, my friend Eric Beinhacker uh, describes my own politics now, which he, he calls himself a progressive localist. And that is, look, I would love our federal government to work great, but right now there is zero trust at the government level. And when you need to go fast, um, uh, you've got to have high levels of trust. And people trust their state government more than their federal government, and they trust their local government now more than their, more their state government. And they government. trust their local news more than their national Absol news. Absolutely. And I think that what you actually see when you go in the country is the country is not divided between the coast and the center. It's divided between communities that are tragically collapsing where the bottom is falling out, and by communities that are actually rising from the bottom up because they've created complex adaptive organisms where the business community now is deeply collaborating with the public school system. Civic groups and uh, philanthropies are supporting their work, supplemental learning opportunities, um, and, uh, uh, and all kinds of um, uh, internships and the like. And then the local government is learning to leverage their local assets. They're not waiting for Ford Motor to come in with a 25,000 person factory, which is now 2,500 robots and 500 people. But they're learning to leverage their local assets, Louisville, it's bourbon tourism, it's being UPS hub, it's Humana, in order to really grow into the world. And I think it's actually the most exciting space in America right now, politically and economically. And I think we really have a chance to get to this synthesis of where globalism, and localism are unbalanced, and as my friend K.R. Sridhar says, that's when you get humanism. And I actually think we really have a chance to get there. Well, you kind of screwed up my lightning round because Sorry. we're out of time, oh, but that's no. an excellent <laughs> okay, point, no, Tom, Freeman. Tom Freeman, David Brooks. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, we're not finished. We got one more thing to do. I think there's probably airplanes leaving. Yeah, is it? Air I think there's a large airplane leaving. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, Walter, lightning round. Yes. Your favorite New York Times columnist. Uh, you just saw him on stage. Yeah, very nice, very nice. Lightning round, your favorite Washington-based magazine of ideas. Uh, the Atlantic. Very nice, very nice. Okay. Uh, so, Walter, listen, this is... Oh, this uh, is the Aspen Idea is closed. The Aspen Idea yeah. magazine. Uh, Walter, uh, this is going to be a very uh, hard-hitting, confrontational interview, as you can, I'm sure you can imagine. But before I feel we... feel like before, Tom Price. I'm before, ready to defend health Before, before uh, I, I, I interview you, um, there's something that all of us uh, here wanted you to see. Ah. Oh. I hope. <laughs> Walter has the gift for seeing things other people don't see. I had not met Walter when my staff came in and said, Walter Isaacson wants to come by for a meeting. He arrived with a couple of people and I had a couple of people there. I was engaged only to meet the famous Walter Isaacson. Um, I knew I wouldn't have any particular interest in whatever he proposed. But then he began to describe what the Aspen Ideas Festival might be. And my group got really excited. It was hugely engaging. Everybody was warm and friendly. And Walter left, and I turned to my staff and said, we're not doing that. It had nothing to do with the merits of the idea. It's that I had never had a business partner. And my staff pleaded, and I said, well, you can go to the next step. I didn't see the magnitude of what he would create, and I surely didn't see what a privilege it would be to work with him. We all have heard of music festivals, we all have heard of arts festivals. What's an ideas festival? 
And among the ideas that were so important and ideas that Walter accepted were that we would not just celebrate one big idea each year, but that we would actually celebrate myriad ideas. First of all, I think Walter has done incredible things for Aspen and kind of brought it alive after a period where it was kind of somnolent. Um, and when he became president, everything changed. I'm pleased to be able to say something about Walter, but I have to be honest, I really don't like him. And the reason I don't like him is he makes me and everybody else look bad. He's writing books and he's running an organization while each of us is just trying to do one job at a time. He's doing two jobs at a time. He makes the rest of us look bad. Walter has lived up to the promise of bringing more people into the Institute than you would imagine and making it more diverse just because he's open. He's open-minded. The thing that one sees is Walter's brilliance in interviewing because he can pretty much interview anybody and somehow you sit there and you think, how did you think up that question? Or he's able to keep it interesting in a way by the way that he questions things. He's a great interviewer. He knows the subjects cold. Uh, he's also a little bit like the Mater Dei of Aspen, so he makes everybody feel welcome. Occasionally he'll bring down the hammer on someone when the hammer needs to be brought down, but he usually elicits more information uh, through, uh, through charm. I remember we did a history of American music together and he spoke to me about things that I grew up listening to and some kind of way he got me to play my instrument. And I remember it was in a way that didn't seem contrived because I do a lot of interviews and people oftentimes ask me to play and I know it's coming. I didn't know it was coming and the timing was perfect. I don't know whether he truly understands every single thing, person that he's interviewing, but he sure makes it seem that way. I remember in the early days of the festival, we asked him if, if it would be possible to bring younger people to the, to the Ideas Festival, to campus. Yeah, well, you know, he, he did say, yeah, yeah, we can bring young people, you know, 30, 40 year olds. And right. <laughs> we said, no, we're, you know, we're thinking much younger than that, like juniors in high school. Right. And to his credit, he said yes. He said yes. Right. And, and he shared with us that, you know, a story about when he was in high school and he got the opportunity to go to a, something like that on that the Stanford was campus. Very meaningful to him. And it changed his life. Yeah. I seriously learn a lot by watching him. He's an impresario. Uh, he's, uh, again, it's all about the mashup, it's all about bringing in a mix of people who will entertain each other, enlighten each other, enlighten the audience that he's also assembled. Walter, this is not what I meant when I said, I wish the president would step down. We are going to miss Walter. We are going to miss uh, Walter, but we know where he's going to be. Yes. And uh, more importantly, we know where Kathy is going to be. Yes, I was going to so say, we'll... yeah, I'm going to really miss Kathy yes. too. Well, thank you, Walter. And we promise that we'll keep asking you to come back. Walter, I want to thank you for extending my life. Let me explain what I mean. Recently, at the Duke Divinity School, I was told that people that go to the Aspen Ideas Festival are guaranteed to live a long life. And when their time does come, there's a special place in heaven reserved for them. So I want to thank you, Walter, for encouraging me to come, thereby extending my life and ultimately giving me a special place in heaven. Walter, thank you for doing two things. The first is uh, creating a safe space for billionaires. It's, it's, it's what the country needed right now. Uh, and the second is uh, thank you for creating and maintaining an Aspen Ideas Festival. It's a place where, over time, we've generated a lot more light than heat, and that's a rare thing in America today. Walter, not only have you transformed the Institute with your inspiring leadership, you've awakened my responsibility as a human being. Thanks to your mentorship and all that I've learned at the Aspen Institute under your direction, my life and my energy are now focused on giving back to the world that's given me so much. Walter, there's no way to explain all the things that you've done for Aspen, and you brought it alive. It is your imagination and your verve and your energy that has made it fantastic. And the Ideas Festival embodies a lot of that um, in a way where all the people that you think need to talk to each other, exchange ideas, do a lot of arguing also, it's typical of the way that you like to operate, and it is brilliant, and I think everybody is grateful to you. Walter, you took Washington by storm when you arrived in 2003. You stayed with us for 14 years, and now are gone. In my life, you have been more consequential than any U.S. president who came through this city. Whoa. There are a thousand people who are going to miss Walter Isaacson in Washington. Nobody is going to miss you more than I. 
Hello, Walter. Yes, indeed. Thank you for everything you've done, your blood, sweat, and tears, ideas, and hard work to bring all of this stuff together so that we can have a hub to share and to grow and to expand our knowledge, but to also change the world. Thank you very much. Love you. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I didn't know about that. Wow. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, thank you, David. Thank you, Jim and Bob and Bill and everybody. Uh, in so, the lightning round, we were asked the scene you like to reread in books. There's a scene when Huck gets to get off the raft after Jim comes, and he gets to go back and hear his own funeral eulogy. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. That's the part yeah, I yeah. like. He's been, he's been walking around all week saying he's uh, forgotten but not gone, but you're, <laughs> you're neither are forgotten or gone. You're, you're, you're right here with us, and we want to talk for a few minutes. Uh, uh, just about your uh, your time here in Aspen and all the things that are coming. So why don't we just why don't we do this? Why don't why don't uh, you talk for a minute or two about how this came about? Uh, this was your idea, the Aspen Ideas Festival. Uh, you and David worked on this together. You created this. Um, tell me what you were thinking when you when you when you when you pulled this together, and 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 talk to me about what has worked yeah. from your perspective, and tell me what hasn't worked yet. Okay, and it wasn't just me. It was David, the group at, at the Atlantic, but also Elliot and Kitty and everybody else you saw that's been in, that involved. That cluster right back there. Yeah, the so cluster they're all back clustering there, together. Especially Kitty. But, uh, you know, I had been to a lot of conferences, and we had done some here in the very first, you know, with technology conferences or medical conferences. And one of the things I've always believed is that if you bring diverse, instead of siloing ideas, bring diverse ideas and thoughts together so that people are thinking about science and cutting the human genome when they're also thinking about political discourse and how do we make it better, that that mix could be good. I also, you know, one of the things we worried about was, you know, th is it just indulgent? Is it just ideas? And we spent a lot of time making sure ideas lead to action and we found ways to take some of these but more and more, I began to believe that curiosity for its own sake is what makes humans the way they are, and that if we want to be listeners, as it was discussed, you have to be generous listeners, which means you actually have to be curious about things. And so that's all worked. I think what hasn't worked is that sometimes we do get too much into our own bubble, rather elite, also uh, not as... Um, you know, diversity, uh, even in the early years, we used to have a lot of pastors and ministers come in on religion. We used to have more people from the military. I think we need to always make sure that, as we discussed in the other panels, that we're trying hard to hear the voices that we don't hear, because in our society, because of technology, instead of growing up with a that's the way it is type set of facts, we go to our corner of the talk radio dial or our little part of the blogosphere or our Twitter feed and get echoed of people we agree with. And if I were to charge you all uh, for the future is make sure the diversity and ideological diversity and socioeconomic diversity is always better. Talk, talk about elitism for a second. I mean, we were in this moment mm -hmm. when, uh, when we have, you could divide the world in any number of ways, but yeah. there is a great resentment of elites. Um, let's not kid ourselves. The, the, this group yeah, here is considered an elitist group. Aspen is considered an elitist place. Uh, I mean, the, the, the question are, what, what is wrong with elitism, or what is wrong with elitism as it's practiced in a way here and in Washington, New York, San Francisco, LA, all the places one associates with this kind of uh, uh, movement that people resent? Yeah, the first book I wrote with Evan Thomas uh, was about the elite, and it was about six friends who were 
pretty much um, you know, part of the American establishment elite. And it was a pay on to that notion that you put party, you put above politics and everything else. It was Bob Lovett, John McCloy, Harriman Atchison, Bolin Ken, and that crowd. And I very much believe that we want to trust uh, an elite or gatekeepers. I do believe that the elite, the gatekeepers, by gatekeepers I mean editors of Time or people who run CNN, kind of failed because we were too tightly guarding the type of information that went out. So this rebellion is kind of a good thing, as well as the fact that you now don't have to trust the gatekeepers and get news wherever you want. So this is a natural uh, reaction that I think is good. I do hope that at some point uh, we realize that having some expertise is and some grounding in facts is actually a good thing. Is there a way of convincing people who don't like elites to like elites? Is there something that the elites can do specifically there to bridge this yeah. gap? Well, uh, both David and Tom said it well, but in the uh, spirit of Aspen Ideas Festival, even though it's been said before, not everybody's you said it. You have not said it. So I will say it again, which is that there, was, there are people who have benefited enormously by globalization, by technology by trade and openness. And those people, and I put myself in that category, are very grateful, and we often move. We leave our communities, we get to go to New York, we get to run things. And then there are people who are not as advantaged, or for a variety of reasons, not des as desirous of being part of an information age, world is flat, globalization economy. And they often build up resentments because they're left behind in places where jobs have now been lost. And Ben started the conversation, but it's got repeated a few times, which is going back to communities. I mean, I saw Steve Case just wandered in right there. Steve is doing a great job picking up on some things J.D. Vance said at the end of the book, and I think what I hope will be the beginning of his next book, which is maybe we ought to go back to Columbus, Ohio, which is where you're starting your next bus tour, but where J.D. Vance is saying, okay, I actually came out of the hillbilly elegy crowd and made it to Yale and heaven knows what, the Marines, but maybe I ought to go back. And I think the divide between people who left their communities and people uh, who now say maybe we should narrow that a bit uh, and reconnect I think things are going to happen on the local level if we're going to cure ourselves. Let me talk about your career for a moment. Uh, and it's a question that people ask about people like you in these moments. Um, how did you know that it was time to leave? Why did you decide that this was the moment when you should step down from this position? I didn't, uh, you know, I mean, I, there have been times when I knew it was time to leave, like when I was running CNN and I just realized I'm not very good at running a news network and I'm not sure I like all of it. Uh, Imagine it, the joy you yeah. could have today doing that. Yes, right. I think I would have a lot of fun running CNN today. Um, I decided that you know, after seven years, it's about time to leave. And so seven years came, and I said, what am I thinking? You know, <laughs> give up this? So after eight years, Kathy and I discussed, wait, you mean we would get? And so then after nine years, and it finally got to be after 14 years, I think it's probably good to always say, what's the next act? You know, meaning, and I think if you get too late and you, you almost have the, I mean, this is the best job in America. It really, I mean, it is the best job in America. And if you don't sort of say, okay, it's got to be replenished, there's got to be some fresh blood. I've come up with some ideas that we've done, including Ideas Festival or growing the Aspen Global Leaders Network or going to our youth empowerment thing. But there's got to be somebody out there saying, okay, we need, Here's a whole set of new ideas. We need an Aspen every town in America, or we need, a, or whatever, ideas that I don't have yet. So it wasn't just, it's all about me, it's actually about an institution. Some people, you know, I go back to Steve and others, are really into startups. I've always discovered I'm into stewarding institutions, Time Magazine, you know, or loving institutions, the places I went to school, college. They all were here 300 years before I came, and I hope they'll be and you want to steward them just right. I think stewarding an institution is fundamentally different from being an entrepreneur 
And we watched uh, Jeff Immelt, who stewarded a 130-year-old institution and had to give up at a certain point. I think when you understand institutions, it makes you feel something extraordinarily important, which is it's about something larger than yourself. It isn't just about you. So it got to a certain point was it wasn't just about me saying what's good for my life. It's saying I had a lot of ideas when I came here. I think I've done most of them. Maybe a couple of them failed, but I think most of them succeeded. What's best for the institution? And it would be good to have somebody with a whole set of new ideas. Uh, By the way, I think we found the, uh, Jim. I was sitting with Jim Crown, who's our chair. And after a lot of discussion of can robots take every job or whatever, I think we may have found a new leader because Shimon, the um, marimba player, right. is able to lay down a track after a backbeat better than I can. I'm better, I think, at dinner parties with Linda. But they're like, whoa, but can you, uh, you know, play the marimba? So it proves any job can be taken only over by a robot. Only if Shimon can perform in comedy night. Will I agree to that? I don't know. Uh, he I said he would. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, uh, a lot of this is about a pull, though. Let's be fair. There's a, you, you, there's a pull happening here, a pull by your yeah. hometown. Uh, and there are a lot of people here who want to know the answer to this question. Are we going to be calling you Mr. Mayor in a few years? No. Or what about Mr. Sanitation Commissioner? No. Uh, what about Mr. I, I mean, think, talk, talk about your future as it relates to the city you love more than any yeah. place I mean, I Earth. love this place. I love New Orleans. I love New York where we we'll spending time. I will be, uh, you'll be calling me uh, Mr. Commissioner because I'm going to be on the City Planning Commission, or am now. And I actually feel that the change that's going to happen is happening locally. If we're going to say, hey, how do we make Canal Street into a zone of enterprise, you know, so that the next time the rise of the rest bus comes along, there'll be, or how do we deal with Airbnb in a way that's both good for communities, good for business and entrepreneurship, but also like racially sensitive, all of these things. So I love the notion of going back and being involved in city planning. Kathy's involved in now and joined the biggest foundation there, the great uh, New Orleans Foundation. Um, so I think we have both discussed that the impact we can make right now, I'm lucky that the locality I get to go back to is not, you know, with all due respect, you know, Honolulu or someplace. You know, it's an interesting city. But, um, uh, but, uh, but I do think that figuring out, if we're going to bridge this horrible divide we have in our politics, we don't have that divide locally. I mean, you've seen the mayor, you've seen the governor in many places. Potholes get filled on a bipartisan basis. Figuring out how to deal with Uber, Airbnb, or enterprise, or bringing in new businesses is not partisan yet. And so maybe if we're going to build a world that's more commonsensical, in fact, centered, not just moderate, but centered, not just centrist, it will come from people who say, let's build from the local level upward again. Uh, I want to talk, please. <laughs> I, um, Linda's done that, so she applauded. The, uh, uh, you, you've, um, you've built this institution uh, uh, with many people. You named some Elliot Kitty and, mm -hmm. and, and the board. Um, I want you to talk for a minute about a person that you really worked with constantly uh, to build this institution with, and that's Kathy. Mm -hmm. Talk about Kathy's role in the lab. Can I top Tom Friedman talking about yeah, Anne? Yeah, yes. yeah. Don't rush the stage. Yeah, she Whatever you do. She does edit everything and is sitting there saying, you can't really say this in Leonardo because it would, so, um, but it's not just being an editor. I mean, I love Kathy extraordinarily deeply, but one thing I figured out early on is not just loving somebody, but also liking somebody, to be there on a Sunday morning, not just a Saturday night. And we share the same enthusiasms. I share the enthusiasms for all the work she's done on the Washington Area Women's Foundation, then New York that she's been involved in all the work that she's done as a lawyer, but then applying that to the governance of great institutions. And I think she shares my love of New Orleans. In fact, I watch every domino tumble, because there are things about New Orleans that are hard to take. One of them is Mosca's Restaurant. And <laughs> when we first started dating, there's a scene in Diner that my friends from kindergarten all replicate. You've heard about some of them, Stephanie and Thomas, whatever. We all go to Mosca's when you bring a new date into town, a girlfriend, and Kathy was sitting with me at Mosca's and tasted the oysters and said, ooh, it's too much garlic in these oysters. 
And Jimmy Smith, who has now become a close friend, takes his napkin and writes one and holds it up. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the fact is that we still got married, that she now likes Mosca's. She's even learned to like not only John Baptiste, but uh, Dr. John. Uh, you know, it helps when you share each other's enthusiasms. Uh, one more question on this festival. Uh, uh, tell me your, uh, I don't want to ask for one favorite moment. Give me a couple of favorite moments over the last decade and a half almost. You know, what I like, and Kitty has always urged people in her opening comment, is to go to things you don't know about. And I mean, I've actually not heard many of the political conversations we've had this week. I've been, uh, and so over the years, I can remember a lot of the science conversations. For example, it started uh, early on, we did uh, uh, things on what will be the new life sciences, but just a couple days ago, I remember Jennifer Dudna talking about exactly how you can use CRISPR to say I can give your kid and your kid's kids higher bone mass, better muscles, maybe a different skin color, maybe different eye colors at different heights, and will our moral processing power keep up with our scientific advance. One of the things that's happened in uh, human civilization is miraculously, with each new technological advance, our moral processing power has kept up with it. You might pick a few counterexamples, maybe the use of the atom bomb, you can you know, discuss it at least. But now we're faced with a time, as Tom Friedman wrote about in his most recent book, in which there's so many tsunamis happening, whether it's a cloud, whatever, and two of them are genetic editing to me and uh, robotics, whether or not, with a, not half jokingly, that machine behind us will soon become so good that there won't be jobs. Never in human history have robots put us out of work, but the question is whether it's gene editing or robotics, this time it's different. So that's a long way of saying that the people I didn't really know were going to be great speakers, but talked about the intersection of advances with morality. That's the sweet spot of the Aspen Institute. We start by reading Plato's Republic. So when we know, when Plato says you put on the ring, you become anonymous, you would lose your civil discourse. We kind of know that's what's happening in Twitter. We get it. Uh, but how do we apply the basic leadership and moral values we learn at the Aspen Institute to the problems of society today? One more, one more question. And people should understand that this is not Walter's last day at the Aspen Institute. He's going to be around for a while, uh, a little bit longer as the board uh, executes a search. Uh, I don't want to ask you about this search, obviously, but I want to, uh, I want to understand what you want to do with the next few months, uh, how you want to orient the, the Institute and its programs, and, and where, if you're casting your mind out five or 10 years, I'm sure you know, nobody's going to hold you to this, but where you want to see this institution and the festival? Where, where do you want to see them? I would like to see, but I'm not going to be the next president of the Aspen Institute, and uh, I don't know if my successor's in the room or not, whether Shimon is still listening, but um, <laughs> Aspen has a secret sauce, as Elliot has said often, which is Aspen. You get people to this mountain, and they're elevated, and they're thinking, and they can, you know, they kind of walk. It's not like going to Davos, where somebody swept on a stage, or something in New York. And we've not yet cracked the code of how would you replicate Aspens in Akron and Columbus, or in Ankara, and, you know, we do have overseas Aspens. I would like to see a way of taking Aspen and making it a part of the fabric of American society, especially for younger people in less served communities, but also in towns around America, and making it a fabric of the world. Because we are now starting to see, I hope, the re-Aspenization of, of uh, the global discourse. We went through a wave of populism and Brexit and tribalism and everything else, and it's almost been a 20-year culmination with Brexit, Trump, and many things. Now, with Macron and others, you sense a feeling that maybe we ought to try to be more temperate, more moderate, and understand the benefits of living in a great age and be more optimistic about living in a great age. Um, I would love to see Aspen help develop that and help heal this divide that's happened globally. 
and I don't have the answer for how to do that, which is why it's a good time for me to leave and say, I hope the next person who comes along will say, uh, it's not just magical, it's also widespread. Uh, Walter, I think uh, everybody in this room uh, uh, feels a great deal of gratitude to you and to Kathy uh, for building everything that you've built. And obviously, everyone in this room wants to see you often uh, in the future. And so there's one thing that I want to give you before we oh, close out the festival. And I, I say this on behalf of Jim Crown and the board and all of the employees and supporters of the Aspen Institute on behalf of David and Catherine Bradley and all of your friends at the Atlantic. Uh, I wanted to give you uh, these, uh, which are the first ever, first and only, forever passes to the Aspen <laughs> Ideas Festival. So you have to come back. Hold on. Kathy, here's yours. Ladies and gentlemen, Walter Isaacson. Let me put it on. Thank you. You're good. Yep.